first off, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jim Adamski with CDL Wisconsin Roth Sugar Bush. Um, I live up in Northeast Wisconsin, been a sugar maker for about 37 years, and I'm an equipment consultant that kind of travels all over the Midwest. So I get to see all kinds of uh, interesting things. So, so when we talk about syrup or sanitation, you know, really proper sanitation, you know, equals quality maple syrup. And so many things that, that we do as syrup makers, um, we can affect the flavor of our syrup. You know, the only thing that really differentiates maple syrup from other sweeteners such as cane sugar or corn syrup is our delicate maple flavor. And that delicate maple flavor, we can, we can, really, uh, we can really disrupt that or, or really harm that maple flavor in a lot of different ways. So when we talk about sanitizers, this is what people usually think of, you know, just your common everyday household sanitizers. And when we look at sanitizers, we, we really want to make sure that we're using <clears throat> a, a good sanitizer with our maple equipment. So when we talk about sanitizers, we really want to try to avoid those household sanitizers. We want to avoid um, any sanitizers that ha have heavy perfumes or added fragrances. The thing with maple syrup that, that all of us, mo a lot of us know and, and a lot of people have found out over the years is maple syrup can transfer odors and smells right into the flavor of the syrup. Uh, maple syrup is just a sponge for, for like say any off flavors or any odors. So kind of keep that in mind as we, as we use those sanitizers, we wanna make sure that they are unscented. Now, we really wanna avoid any iodine based sanitizers such as your dairy sanitizers. Once again, we, we see the flavor transfer over uh, to our maple syrup. So when we talk about sanitizers, really a, a good sanitizer to use is, is an unscented household bleach. And when we talk about bleach, we wanna make sure that, you know, we're not using a commercial bleach. Uh, typically our household uh, chlorine bleaches are usually about a five and a quarter percent um, strength. And that is a sodium hypochlorite solution. So commercial bleaches can be a lot stronger. So when we talk about commercial bleaches, you know, we can have a 10 or 15% concentration of that particular sanitizer. And when we use that sanitizer, it takes a tremendous amount of water to make sure that we are, are not having any cross-contamination of that, of that stronger bleach. So the recommended mix ratio for a household bleach with a five and a quarter percent uh, concentration of sodium hypochlorite it is really one part unscented household bleach to 20 parts of clean water. So that is the, the mix ratio for our sanitizer if we are gonna use just a regular household bleach. We wanna make sure that if we are gonna use a regular household bleach, we rinse with plenty of clean hot water, you know, just to make sure that we are not seeing any cross-contamination of, of that sanitizer um, into our syrup. We're gonna talk a little bit about off-season equipment storage. Um, we want to make sure that we're storing our collection equipment and, and, and maple syrup making equipment in a clean, dry place in the off season. Um, we want to really avoid the unventilated, unventilated spaces. A lot of times I'll walk into a sugar house and, and, and you pull open the door, the customer opens up the door and we head on in and, and you'll pick up a musty smell or an earthy smell. Um, if you have your syrup filter bags, if you have your RO filters stored in this type of environment, a lot of that odor that comes from that sugar house can be transferred over into these stored filters and other equipment. And, and that odor, like I said, can be absorbed into our maple syrup. You know, if you have electricity at your sugar house, usually a dehumidifier will help keep spaces drier. Um, it, it takes that musty smell or that musty odor of a, of a tight, sealed up building that's got a fair bit of moisture in it. It'll, it'll, it'll keep that odor out of there. It'll also help uh, prevent growing a lot of mold and, and mildew in the off season. So we're gonna talk about quality a little bit and, and quality begins in the woods. You know, and I've got a, a couple, couple pictures up here on the screen of, of some things that we really don't wanna see anymore, but we see on a, on a quite regular basis. Um, syrup makers in some instances are a little bit thrifty. Um, so we see them uh, using equipment that we shouldn't necessarily be using. Um, you know, we'd really like to eliminate the, the picture on the left of, of all of the old, uh, you know, rolled tin taps with the old English tin or galvanized metal on. We really would like to get them out of the system. Um, same thing with the slide over on the right or the picture on the right. Uh, we see some galvanized fittings. 
um, into a tubing system um, that has a just a regular old black water line or a, a non FDA approved uh, maple uh, pipe. Um, so we really want to like say make sure that we get you know some of this material out of the system that 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 rust and, and other contamination that we can pick up off these fittings and pick up off these taps you know is going right into our maple syrup. I always tell producers if you if you wouldn't feed your child out of that container, you shouldn't be using it for for syrup production. We'll talk a little bit about taps, you know, depending on uh, what you're using for taps, you know, if you're, if you're a bag uh, holder and, and bucket, uh, bucket producer, um, you know, the cast aluminum taps are very, uh, very common. Um, the castings on the new taps are, are fairly smooth. They're easy to keep clean. Um, if you are a tubing producer um, or uh, using a tubing tap to, to run a hose down into a bucket, you're more familiar with the, the fitting or the, the spout on the right, which is, is one of our uh, disposable taps. Um, the thing is, if you are a producer and you can use the disposable taps, the disposable taps offer about a 17% yield increase when uh, that oh, tap is replaced on an annual basis. Um, if you are using the cast aluminum taps or stainless steel taps for bag holders or buckets, uh, these taps should be sanitized on an annual basis. And, and the reason that we, the reason that we see, um, you know, the sanitization of the tap or the disposable tap being used is when we drill a hole into that maple tree, we have a nice sterile clean cut tap hole. The minute that we put a dirty tap that's carrying a fairly good load of microbial contamination, once we put that tap into that tap hole, we trigger that tree's compartmentalization process or healing process. So if we put a clean tap into a clean cut tap hole, we do not trigger that tree to want to heal itself. But the minute, like I say, that we put that dirty tap into that tap hole, we trigger that, uh, we trigger that tree's healing process. So that's where we see the difference in yield. So if we are going to sanitize taps and if we want to reuse them, we want to make sure those taps are, are rinsed with plenty of hot water. We want to make sure these taps are, are stored in a dry place, um, you know, throughout the off season. Buckets, pails, bag holders, um, all of these items, once again, should be washed and sanitized after the season is over. Um, make sure items like say are rinsed thoroughly. Um, if you're, you know, if you're going to use a bleach sanitizer, make sure you're, you're rinsing with plenty of hot water. Um, store them in a, you know, a, a nice, dry, clean location, you know, and if, if we, if at all possible, if they're going to be in a sugar house, you know, make sure it's, it's, it's well ventilated, you know, make sure that we're not getting that musty, uh, mildewy smell throughout the off season. So tubing systems. One of the biggest things that we see for syrup quality are poor tubing systems. Um, so um, an example of that is, is the slide over on the left. Um, you know, we see a line that is, or multiple lines that are, are very uh, saggy um, that will trap sap in the off season. Uh, those of you that have had a tubing line go down in the summer, uh, they'll grow all kinds of nice black and green material in them in the off season if they're if they're sagged down and full of liquid. So, so really we wanna make sure that we're maintaining our tubing systems properly. The slide over on the right shows a little different style of tubing system. One that has had the lines tightened up, um, has support posts in for long spans so that we're not seeing any bagging or any trapping of sap. We wanna make sure that that tubing system has enough slope on it that we have the liquid run out of that tube in the off season so that we're not seeing pockets of sap sitting in the lines in the, in the off season. So to kind of recap a little bit about the tubing systems, we wanna make sure the main lines are tight. You know, if we do have some long spans, we should get them supported with some posts. Uh, tight 5 16th lines, we wanna make sure they are as sag free as possible uh, so that we uh, drain all the sap out of them. For the producers that are, are, are using uh, vacuum, um, a great idea is to tap with the vacuum on in the spring when you're untapping and give yourself the opportunity when you pull that tap to suck all the sap out of the system or out of the lines. Um, if the woodlot, like, like say, is, is very flat, use the support post. Um, be aware of your woodlot and, and the temperatures in it. You know, so if we have a really nice south-facing slope, we probably want to use that lighter colored main lines, your lighter greens, your lighter blues. You know, if we do have some north facing slopes in our woodlot, uh, black main lines or darker colored main lines thaw very rapidly. 
Um, if we have a, a shaded woods uh, with a lot of spruce and hemlock mixed in with maybe some some silver or some red maple, you know, that's another spot where we want to use that that darker colored main line, that black main line. Um, we also have some some different colored uh, five sixteenths or lateral lines available for woodlots like that. Uh, we have some gray shadow tubing. If you are in an area of your woods that is is very shaded by spruce and hemlock, but yet we want to get that thawed out right away first thing in the morning, we do have some some uh, gray or, or light black um, 5 16th line available so we can get that thought out. The biggest thing that we want to really see people use is we really want to see them use an FDA approved mainline pipe in the woods. You know, we really want to stay away from water lines. So when you look at an FDA approved pipe under a microscope and you look at a water line under a microscope, the surfaces and the finishes of those two pipes are completely different. Waterline is really meant to be flushed with hundreds to thousands of gallons of water on a daily basis. So for those of you that live in the country, you have your own house well, think about the black plastic pipe that's coming from your well into your house. You know, that particular, oops, I gotta go back a page, hang on here. That particular pipe is, is really meant to be flushed with hundreds of gallons of water on a daily basis to make sure that it stays clean. Of course, in a, in a maple system, we don't deal with 100 gallons or hundreds of gallons in some lines in the course of a day. So we have a lot smoother finish on that FDA approved piping. And it has, uh, you know, we usually see that FDA approved stamp right on the outside of the pipe. Once again, tubing systems, sags and dips create, you know, areas that trap uh, sap and bacteria, you know. The biggest thing that we've really seen from a quality point of view over the last number of years is we want to make sure that we get the sap out of the tubing systems really as quickly as we possibly can. The longer that we have sap in a tubing system, the more heat um, that it picks, it, the sap picks up from the pipe as it sits in there longer, the higher the temperature goes. Once the temperature starts to grow, go up, you know, we grow microbial contamination a lot quicker. So the quicker we can get the, the sap out of the tubing system and into a storage tank, um, you know, that'll definitely help our, our quality. We talk about tubing sanitizers. Um, you know, this is one that some people like to sanitize tubing, some people don't. And there's been a lot of sanitizer studies done, um, you know, throughout the course of the years. I think the last one I saw done was uh, by University of Vermont or University of Maine. I'd have to, uh, I'd have to look back to know for sure. Um, you know, like I said, a great resource for that is, is mapleresearch.org. That is a great website full of well-vetted research. Okay, not, nothing wrong with, you know, internet, but, um, you know, not everything you read on the internet is necessarily true. So that can be a good resource for someone starting out or even an experienced veteran in the maple world is, is mapleresearch.org. There's a lot of good university-based, fact-based research there. So we talk about uh, sanitizing tubing. Uh, bleach can be used um, in, in a tubing system. Like say, we'll, we'll run with that recommendation of the five and a quarter uh, percent sodium hypochloride to 20 parts water. Um, if we want to sanitize with bleach, we must use a large volume of water to make sure that we flush the bleach out of the system. We also wanna make sure that when we start up the next spring, we let that sap run on the ground for a little bit to make sure that we have all of that sanitizer out of that system. One thing I will say with tubing sanitizers, especially bleach or sanitizers that contain acid and bleach, um, when the sodium hypochlorite salts out, the sodium in it basically turns to salt. So what we do is we start to uh, attract a tremendous amount of rodents to our tubing system, and they think it is blue and black licorice for most cases. So um, be really careful if you are going to use a, a bleach type of sanitizer with your tubing. A water flush, um, you know, you can flush water through the system. Um, the biggest thing is we need to get all the water out of the system. If we leave that water in the system, we can grow bacteria and things that wouldn't normally grow. If we leave sap in the system, say, for example, that sap, as it degrades, turns to more of an acidy material. That acidy material will not let a lot of stuff grow. So like I say, um, we want to make sure if we are sanitizing, we are doing it properly. Um, and this is a reminder to everyone, um, no isopropyl alcohol. Okay, isopropyl alcohol is not an approved sanitizer by the USDA 
in the unit or by the FDA in the United States. It is a substance that is used in Canada and it is approved in Canada, but it is not approved here in the United States. So, so we talked about tapping. Um, this is kind of a, a hard to see picture and I don't, I don't know if you can see my, I might be able to point it out with my mouse. Some of the advice that I got from my grandfather when I was a kid tapping trees is always tap on the south side of the tree because it warms up. And, and when we do that, by not tapping around the whole diameter of the tree, and we always tap strictly on the south side of that tree, what we do is we put a lot of tap holes right next to each other. When we put a lot of tap holes together, like here, here, you can see where I'm pointing with my mouse here, 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 here. We, we, we put a lot of non-functional compartmentalized wood in the tapping band that we're tapping into. Now, if we consistently tap into that area with that stained or compartmentalized wood, there is a good opportunity we can pick up kind of a punky wood flavor or an earthy flavor in our maple syrup by tapping next to all of those old tap holes into that non-functional wood. So we want to make sure that we tap around the whole radius of that tree to make sure or the whole diameter of the tree. We want to make sure we tap around it so that we're always getting that tap set into white wood and we leave that area healed before we come back to tap it. Uh, sap gathering and cross-contamination, you know, we see a lot of different things happening in the wood lots and, and, and be mindful of, you know, when you're collecting sap of what's going on, you know, um, beware of mud and other debris when collecting sap with a gathering trailer. You know, if you're collecting bag holders and or buckets, you know, if it's an open top gathering trailer, um, you know, mud off tires and mud off tractor chains can fly up and, and land in these gathering trailers. And we want to make sure that we are keeping, you know, the debris other than sap out of, out of those tanks. You know, if we are using gas engine transfer pumps and, and we are fueling pumps out in the woodlot, you know, beware of that, that fuel and oil contamination or that cross contamination uh, from fueling transfer pumps. If you, if you spill the gas or, or onto a transfer hose or whatever the case may be and, and be aware of, you know, fuel contaminations from gas cans, oil filters on evaporators or fuel from vehicles. You know, the biggest one we really see is, is the oil fired evaporators when someone goes to change their fuel filter on that oil fired evaporator in their sugar house, you know, take some precautions, take a little extra time, make sure you're putting a drain pan down, um, you know, underneath that oil filter when we're changing it, make sure the tanks are, you know, make sure the tank is turned off, um, you know, wear some disposable gloves. So once we change that oil filter and, and we wash our hands that we, when we go back to production that we are, you know, we don't have that oil residue left on our hands, you know, like say wear some disposable gloves. So, Let's say we just we want to make sure that we avoid all, you know any of them areas where we can cross contaminate our syrup with other other uh, other liquids. So, little tiny little tiny snapper. Yeah. Tiny snapper. So when we talk about sap filtering. We should be yeah. um, filtering our sap. We want to make sure that we remove any you know tree bark moss, yeah. uh, wood shavings, dirt, bugs, etc. From that sap. That's you know just part of the quality process. You know if we start with good clean sap, we're going to make a better quality syrup. Sap storage. So one of my pet peeves that I see, and I, and I travel kind of extensively in the Maple Belt, I get into hundreds of sugar houses throughout the course of the year. You know, don't hang the antifreeze buckets on the trees. Don't hang the oil buckets on the trees. You know, try to, try to buy new collection equipment and especially storage equipment. I the placard information off one of the tote tanks sitting underneath of his releaser. Now this tank was a uh, 250 gallon, one of those white tote tanks. Um, unfortunately, once all of the plat cards and safety decals are peeled off, you don't know what was in them. Well, I had the pleasure of seeing one with all the plat cards on and keep in mind, there was a maple sap releaser sitting on top of this tank. This particular tank contained a chemical Gardelin was so I looked it up on the internet and I got into a hazardous materials handbook and I found out that Gardelin is actually a chemical that is used to etch metal or clean metal prior to painting right so this is what this producer decided to use for a tank if you are going to store sap in a in a tank buy a new tank you know the people that sell all these little cube tanks on the it, it had apple juice in it or it had some other type of food in it. The thing is, even if it's stored food, one in eight people have food allergies. So kind of keep that in mind when we talk about, you know, allergens. So 
SAP storage only. If you're gonna purchase a new tank, make sure it has an NSF rating, which is a little better quality of plastic and it's used for the, you know, can be used for the storage of potable water. You know, so we want a, a little better quality. Even if we triple rinse a container, we, we're not getting rid of the residue. Residue, you know, and like I say, when we look at food aller allergies, you know, we, we really got to be mindful of that. Store our sap in a cool place. We want to make sure we process it as quick. CDL machines and how they need to be cared for, but you know every manufacturer really has their own uh, methodology when it comes to cleaning. Um, rinse machine, some advice with this, rinse the machine with more water than necessary. This is always better. Uh, make sure the membranes are stored properly in the proper storage solutions. The biggest thing that we see is keep the membranes clean. We see a lot of membranes that are put away improperly. And when they're opened up in the spring, they they have some funkiness to them, for lack of better terminology. So we see a tremendous amount of off flavors actually come from reverse osmosis equipment. Um, first number of barrels made made through the sugar house. Uh, membranes weren't taken uh, care of properly, and we have some some funky flavored syrup that comes out of there until those membranes and and that material is flushed out. So. Evaporator pans, um, like I say, we should clean these on a regular basis. Uh, we want to make sure that we remove any nitre buildup from the pans. So any of that brown residue, we want to make sure that we get that off the pans. That can actually cause some flavor transfer into our maple syrup. And our syrup can actually have a nitre or a scorched flavor by too much nitre buildup on our pans. Uh, syrup quality. Like I mentioned before, the flavor of maple syrup can be damaged in, in, in a lot of different ways. You know, uh, I see a lot of sap that should have not been processed get processed. We have, like where I live, we see a lot of people that drive up north, they tap their trees at the cottage on the weekend, the sap runs all week, and they go up the next weekend and, and boil it. And we see a lot of, uh, we see a lot of syrup that's uh, made that's not very good, you know, not very good quality. So like I say, make sure we uh, are doing a good job with our, our sap, boiling it relatively quickly, and then make sure we're storing it in clean food grade, you know, food quality containers. So, so we're gonna talk a little bit quick about density. Um, the IMSI a number of years ago set forth some standards in the industry um, for uh, measuring maple syrup density. Uh, minimum soluble, uh, minimum density basically of maple syrup is going to be 66 bricks. Maximum is going to be 68.9. Okay, and these are, are really set all on the brick scale. So these are the, are the minimum and maximum that we like to see or, or where we need to have our maple syrup. One, so it doesn't spoil. And two, so that it doesn't create a ton of sugar in the bottom of our containers. So how critical is, is this measurement? 66 bricks or less, our syrup will spoil, okay? So even if we hot pack it, seal it into a bottle, 66 bricks or less, our syrup will spoil. If we go over 68 bricks, we may generate sugar crystals in the bottle, okay? Uh, one bricks below 66, uh, you know, 65 bricks, sap, their syrup is very thin, it's very watery. Uh, one bricks above 67. When we go to 67 bricks, syrup gets really thick. Um, it changes the one one point from 66 to 67. The viscosity of that liquid changes approximately four times. It gets a lot more thicker. When we have that little bit of thicker syrup, it gives the perception that it's actually sweeter than it is because it stays on the palate longer. So tools to get measure density. We we have our hydrometers. We have our refractometers. We have our electric refractometer. And we have a hydrotherm, which is a combination of a hydrometer and a thermometer. We don't see too many of them out here in the Midwest. That was a, a tool that was primarily used a number of years ago back east. So if we do happen to overcook our syrup, if you have a North American maple syrup manual, there is some density correction formulas based on how far you are overcooked and how much water or uh, sap or and or permeate that you need to add back to that syrup to bring it back. A great resource is the, the North American uh, syrup manual for um, even a hobbyist producer to the most experienced producer. Um, a new draft of this manual will be coming in 2022. So kind of stay tuned for that. Um, it is a great reference for pretty much everything maple. You know, anytime that I do a presentation, 
you can always go back or to a topic, you can always go back and, and, and go to that North American manual for a, for a quick reference. We talk about filtration. We wanna make sure that our syrup is free of sugar sand and or nitre. Um, sugar sand and nitre can give an off flavor in maple syrup if it is not filtered out. You know, we can pick up that, uh, like say that, that nitery or um, if, if we don't get the sugar sand out of, this, out of the syrup itself, when you taste that, uh, when you taste that uh, syrup, it'll actually have a, a grainy flavor to it. So what is sugar sand or nitre? It is calcium and magnesium salts of multic acid. And these salts are, are contained in the sap and they are there during the whole boiling process. At any time that we reheat maple syrup up over 200 degrees, we can generate sugar sand or nitre again. So with that being said, if, if we filtered syrup, even through a filter press and we didn't bottle it that day, if we bring that syrup to a rolling boil tomorrow, we can actually create that sugar sand or nitre once again, if we take that over, over 200 degrees. So what will it look like? Sometimes it'll settle to the bottom of the container. It'll look like dirt in the bottom of the container. Sometimes it'll have a, a stay in suspension and uh, it'll look almost like, uh, so I'm gonna take just a second here. I'm gonna, I got my computer off the docking station. I gotta plug her in, unfortunately. So just bear with me. Sometimes it'll stay in suspension, it'll give it a cloudy appearance. Sometimes it may look like a thick, oily substance on the, on the bottom of the container. Um, sugar sand can take up, like say, many different, uh, many different uh, appearances. So um, how do I get it out of my syrup? Uh, one of the very old methods is to, is to pour, let your syrup settle for a prolonged period of time. You can pour the maple syrup off, leaving the sludge on the bottom that contains no sediment. We all work pretty hard at making maple syrup. We really don't want to throw any away. Um, if you look on the internet or some of the, uh, folks in the room may, may know this, uh, concoction, there is a method of, uh, mixing cream, egg, and milk together, uh, pour it into your boiling syrup and it'll bring your sugar sand and nitre up to the top and you can skim it off. Uh, we really recommend, don't recommend this anymore. Um, you know, one in eight people have food allergies, so we want to keep other foods out of our maple syrup. Uh, filter bags is probably the most popular for the for the small producer or the hobby producer. Of course, if we have a filter press or a pressure filter, that is our one of our better options. And then we have kind of a middle of the road option now that is there as well as with the vacuum filter. So we talk about filter bags. It's commonly referred to as gravity filtering. Uh, today, for all practical purposes, these bags are are pretty much made out of Orlon. We have went away really from wool and, and felt materials over the years. Uh, bags should be dampened with, with clean, warm water before they filter, kind of conditions the bag and gets it ready for the filtration process. We want to make sure these bags are washed only in hot water. Do not use any bleach or soap. So as a equipment consultant, I, I get to a lot of sugar houses. I have to taste a lot of, I have to taste a lot of maple syrup. And you can taste soap that has been through a filter bag. I had a couple uh, nice folks, they, they, they make uh, syrup and they wanted me to taste their syrup. And when you taste their syrup, you could actually taste some soap residue in that syrup. And I asked them how they were cleaning their filter bags, and they were cleaning their filter bags by throwing them in the washing machine with no soap. There was enough soap residue left in that washing machine that they could you could pick up that soap flavor. So if your filter is stiff, you want to make sure that it is uh, dry. And it is, you know, I mean, if it's stiff, it wasn't dry when it was put away, it should be replaced. Threadbare and filter bags should be replaced. Um, you know, anytime that, that fibers in that uh, bag are, are compromised, um, we can let that sugar sand or nitre pass through. Um, we wanna make sure that our, our filter bag smells good. Like I said, maple syrup can transfer flavors. So if that filter bag has a musty smell, if it was put away when it was a little bit damp, you know, that smell and that will transfer right into your syrup. We're gonna talk a little bit about pressure filters. Uh, Filter, uh, filter press is probably the most common pressure filter. Um, we're gonna pump that through under pressure through a series of plates and frames. 
We're going to mix some DE powder in there, which is referred to as a filter aid, which comes out during the filtration process. And that's really going to remove that sugar sand denider. So if you're looking for the best clarity you can possibly get, you know, the, the pressure filter press with the DE powder definitely is, is one of the best choice. Uh, vacuum filters are coming onto the market as a very affordable way to filter uh, maple syrup. These can be used with or without DE powder. So it, it really depends exactly, uh, you know, what you want to do or what you want to spend. But this is another alternative that is out there. So I kind of got through it here fairly quick. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or any comments. Jim, I've got one. Stu Peterson? Yes. Hi, Stu. How are you doing? Good Hello. job. Um, <clears throat> sometime in the last year, within the last year, the Maple News had an article, and I think is a sugar maker out of uh, New Hampshire. And uh, it was all about cleaning three sixteenths and to some extent five sixteenths gravity tubing. But the pitch a recommendation from him was to use a swimming pool bleach and it wasn't sodium chloride. It was some other chloride that uh, the advantage being it wouldn't turn salty, number one. And number two, he recommended leaving it in the tubing until fall and then to rinse it out in the fall uh, obviously before freeze up. I just wondered if you had read that or were familiar with those concepts and what you thought. I have not <clears throat> read that article specifically. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I think it was university of Vermont or university of Maine. It was a number of years ago at the North American meeting. There was a sanitate, a tubing sanitation study conducted. And, and really, I guess that's what I always look back at as my benchmark for something that was tried, true, and proven, um, you know, not knowing exactly what specific chemical he was looking at using, I, I can't really give a, a really good recommendation on that. Um, you know, like I say, I, I, I try to use, like I say, as much university, good, solid, you know, vetted research as I possibly can. And so um, I really can't make a whole lot of comments on that one, Stu, so... How about, how, about, how about the concept of leaving the cleaning solution in the tubing for the summer season? I don't know if I would do that. And, 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 the, reason, and the reason that I say that is, you know, when we have sanitizers sit in a system for a prolonged period of time, you know, we start to see some interaction with that, with that product, you know, between the two products, you know. And there has been some research studies I know done by Center Acer on this with, you know, alcohol um, usage and the fact that it sits in the tubing on a prolonged period of time. Um, my, you know, we put a sanitizer in, we get it in, we get it out. The sanitization process is done. And then, like I say, at that stage of the game, it should be flushed with water to make sure that we get all the material out of there. Once it is flushed with water, we need to make sure we get the water out of the system. You know, as it, crazy as it may sound, you know, looking back at some of the university of research, and I know it's, it's, it's a little different methodology, but you know, their, their, their control was doing nothing in, in a water rinse to doing nothing in May or April when you're untapping, by September, we carried the same microbial contamination or the same microbial load in, in a tubing that was sanitized with, with uh, control was nothing, um, flushed with water and sanitized with a light bleach. A lot of the microbial contamination was at the same load in, in, both, in both instances by the time we got to fall. You know, so, Sanitization of tubing has is, is always been one of those topics that, that it's, it's really tough because the minute that we put something into tubing other than sap, you know, we, we got to make sure that we get it rinsed out of there. If we leave sap in there in the, in the tubing system, for lack of better terminology, it, 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 it degrades, it turns to a vinegar, vinegary acid type substance, and we don't grow a lot of material in, in that type of environment. The minute that we flush that system with a tremendous amount of water, and if we don't get that water out of the system, we grow LGs and different things that we wouldn't normally grow because the conditions are susceptible for it. So I don't know if I answered your, if I answered your question or not, Stu, I'm not hundred percent sure. So. Hey, Stu, this yes, is sir. Jesse. I think, uh, 
right along with what Jim has has spoken about, everything's going to have a label recommendation on length of time it takes to actually have the sanitizing effect. So if you look at some of of, uh, the beer sanitizers, it's contact kill in 30 seconds. You look at some others, it's contact kill in three minutes. Uh, And so you have to look at the contact kill rate and then you have to look at, at how many flushes, but it should all be on the label instructions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is Chris. Um, that's the first I'd heard of cleaning. I, I use all bags, all sap sacks. And that's the first I'd heard of cleaning the, the holders. I've always wondered about that because um, mine are often still even sticky the next spring. So I, I, I might have missed that part. What did you recommend cleaning those in? Uh, that that would be that same that that bleach substance, you know, that uh, one part uh, one part five and a quarter percent bleach. Um, you know, we'll scrub them down um, once they're once they're through. You know, get them rinsed. You know, get them dried. You know, completely dry before we put them away. So, okay. And then I also I do boil all my taps um, every mm-hmm. year. I don't take a brush through them. Uh, but I do take, I, I, I have access to an autoclave. I take them to work and throw them in an autoclave, which I think heats them up to about 600 degrees for 10, 15 minutes. Um, and don't seem to have any problems with yield that I notice anyway. Yeah. You should be in pretty good shape there with that type of heat to them. So, so they, they might be a little chunky, uh, little bits and pieces on them, but. It's sterile bits and pieces. Doesn't doesn't work so well on my plastic taps. Yeah, I don't know. I've I've tempted I've been tempted to bring some plastic ones in and throw them <laughs> in and see what happens to them. You mold your own, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, do you recommend cleaning taps in the? You know, I we obviously clean our taps in the spring after the season. Anybody ever clean them again in February before you put them out the next March? You know, there, there really isn't a need. If, if you've got them cleaned, rinsed, dried properly before storage in, in, a, in a sealed container, you know, there really is no reason to go back and, and sanitize one more time. You could if you'd like, but like say, if they were, they were cleaned, dried and put away properly, you know, there really isn't any, any, uh, any reason to go back and, and do it one more time. So. Hello, Jim. My name is Rob Giles. I have a question about replacing the um, tubing taps that have been in for more than a couple of years. Can you pull them out, clean them real good with the bleach, reinstall them, or do you really need to replace them with new taps? Uh, Really replace with new taps. Um, You know, so when we look at the surface of plastics, um, polycarbonates, you know, under that, under that microscope surface, for lack of better terminology, they are still a very porous, uh, very, very porous material. And it's really difficult to, to really clean and sanitize them as clean as a new tap is. Um, you can surely do it. You know, if you don't want to buy taps, you can surely go through and, and, and try to brush clean them and sanitize them as, as best as you can. But, but usually if it, if it is a tubing tap, those taps are, are, are usually between probably 22 and 26 cents each. A lot of times it's just better to, you know, discard or recycle those taps versus, uh, you know, versus trying to, trying to clean and sanitize them and get them, you know, stored properly. So. Okay. And one other question is I have been using water and hydrogen peroxide to clean out my lines and it seems to work fairly well, but this year I've noticed some black mold growing, uh, Inside the tips, mainly a couple of places in the tubing. Yep. Uh, is that a, a good substance to use? Is it acceptable for the uh, food or not? It is, it is an acceptable. It is an acceptable sanitizer. You know, the thing with <laughs> peroxide is, 
Um, and and that was one of the that was one of the uh, the items that was in that that long term tubing sanitation uh, study that they did was hydrogen peroxide. It is a good sanitizer. The thing is, when you have a, a sag or a dip in a five sixteenths line, um, what do we know about hydrogen peroxide? It's H two O two. So what happens is when it degrades, we lose that O two off the end. It just becomes water again as it degrades. So now we, you know, if we have that sag or anything or that moisture left in that system, we don't really have the long-term sanitizing effects because eventually it breaks down, it becomes water. The nice thing is, you know, we don't have to flush it with a tremendous amount of water to get it cleaned out. Um, but like I say, we don't have the long-term sanitizing properties with that material if it is left in the system. It is a good sanitizer if you can sanitize your items in it, pull it out of the hydrogen peroxide rinse them and get them dry. It is a good sanitizer that way. But when we leave it in the system, you know, it breaks down, it come, becomes water. And then we have the, we have the issues of growing things that we wouldn't normally see in the, in the system. So. All right. Thank you. Yep. This is Chris again. Have you ever heard of anyone using um, ethanol or grain alcohol instead of isopropyl? Well, the thing is, anytime that you use any type of alcohol, you're putting a pesticide by law into your tubing system or into your taps. And that is really what prohibits the use of any type of alcohol um, in the use of a tubing system. So we, we kind of went, we kind of talked with, or I've, I've spoken with Abby Vandenberg a few times about this. You know, so there is no product registration, so to speak, for any type of alcohol substance um, that has been put to the FDA to be safe to use in a tubing system. So even though like, we can drink ethanol, you can drink it if you'd like. Yep. <laughs> so, um, like I say, it, it is not a labeled sanitizer by the FDA for for the food grade maple tubing. So I get it. Yep. And Jim, as butcher, I know now why I do do not drink alcohol because it's all pesticide. <laughs> I'll remember that, Butch. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have a question. I get uh, the Stone Solve Dairy Cleaner from Fleet Farm, okay, and let that sit in my evaporator uh, like overnight. Okay. and warm it up a little bit is that uh, a good thing to do it depends if your stone solve that you're using is primarily phosphoric acid okay and yes so so like say you'd have to look at your label um i'm pretty sure it's phosphoric acid which would be an approved pan cleaner uh, for standard syrup production and phosphoric acid is even approved for organic production as long as there is a sufficient water rinse or water intervention after the cleaner has been used, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Jim, what do you use on your pans? Uh, we use phosphoric acid. You do? Oh, yeah, we use, yeah, that's uh, really the, we use phosphoric acid and then um, CDL has a, another style of phosphoric acid um, and that is called SantaClean. So if you're using any type of automated evaporator cleaner, whether it be a, a, a washer for your steam pan, a washer for your flu pan, a washer for your syrup pans, um, SantaClean uh, that version of phosphoric acid, the Santa Clean version, is really about the only type of sanitizer that you're going to be able to run with the automated wash equipment. If you try to use the standard phosphoric acid pan cleaner, um, you'll fill your entire sugar house up with, with soap suds. So the, the Santa Clean is kind of a non-foaming solution that you can run in the automated systems. So. Okay, and that you do it uh, because you're organic also, right? Yeah. Yeah. For us, that uh, for me, that's not organic. Uh, the you recommend that wash at all that the the acid wash? 
Um, oh, oh, heavens, yes, on an evaporator. I would. So what we do at our sugar house, this is, that's a great question, George. Um, we have a tremendous amount of sugar, Sandra Niter, where we live. Um, so about every 20 barrels of syrup, we shut our evaporator down. We drain the, drain the syrup out, fill it up with permeate water from the RO, put in the phosphoric acid, bring it up to just under, a, just so it doesn't boil, let it sit overnight, drain it out the next day, pressure wash, refill the evaporator with a permeate water again, bring it to a boil to make sure that we eliminate any acid residue that's left in the machine, drain it out, and then we put our syrup back in and we go back to processing. But we do that about every, about every 20 drums. The thing is with these new style of evaporators, you know, stainless steel is really a, a, an absolutely poor conductor of heat. And, and everybody is, is running real thin stainless so that they can transfer the heat. You know, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of 22 gauge stainless used in the maple industry. That with a niter buildup on it is, is real subject to burning, you know, and, and we get guys that, that'll buy a new evaporator with a, with a really light gauge stainless pans on, they boil beautiful. Um, but if you had an old evaporator with a, with a real heavy stainless pans on years ago, and, and you could run all season without cleaning your flue pan, and you switch, you know, to the, to the newer evaporators with a thin stainless, there's a good opportunity that, you know, if you run a, run a hundred drums across the flue pan, you're going to, you're going to burn something. So. Hello, this is Rob again. I have a question for you about um, using the phosphoric acid as a cleaner. Mm -hmm. I used to work in a chemical factory and we had to neutralize all of our acids before they went down the drain. Do you neutralize it or is there some way of getting rid of it that's ecologically friendly? So in the U.S. so far, we have not been required to do <laughs> neutralization of cleaning products prior to this. Um, we have been able to ground discharge that material with in Wisconsin with the proper permits. Now in Canada, starting I believe it is next year, any producer over 20,000 taps has to neutralize any of their high pH RO water that's going to be discharged from the wash cycle. Wow. Or, or any of their low pH um, wash water from the evaporator. So I would imagine that it's coming to Canada. It's going to be staring us in the face here before too long, probably in Wisconsin, because we are the most regulated state in the world. Um, <laughs> so, but, but I can foresee that coming in the not too distant future. So, you know, you would want to, you know, if you want it to be, 100% environmentally friendly, you would have to bring that, that acid solution, which is usually going to be probably depending on the strength of your acid, a pH of anywhere from two to four, you're going to want to bring that up to probably six and a half to seven for neutral before discharge. Same thing with RO water, you want to bring that 12 <laughs> pH uh, wash water from the RO back down to neutral before it's discharged. It's not required here yet in the U.S., but I'm sure we will we will see it in the not too distant future. So, what is used to neutralize that? Well, you, baking you, soda. You can do it with baking soda, but the thing is, you know, I, and I'm not going to be the guy that's going to give any recommendations when it comes to neutralizing acid because when we start <laughs> to pour when we start to pour that baking soda into that material, we are going to give off a gas, and if you're not in a well ventilated area, you're going to have some issues. So you know, kind of keep that in mind. It, it can neutralize, but when you start talking neutralizing the amount of acid that is contained in a, even a three foot by seven foot flue pan, you know, there's probably 40 gallons of acid filled water, 50 gallons of acid filled water in that pan. It takes an awful lot of baking soda to neutralize that product. So I didn't give you a lot of helping hints there, my friend. I'm sorry. Uh, so, that's okay. Uh, I, I work at a place where we have to discharge acids, and we have a, um, a lime pit. So if you if ah. you put an acid in, it's basically this crushed, super fine limestone. We dump our acids in, and it's it's built into the floor, and it's it's kind of a plumbing system, but it neutralizes the acids, and we have to replace that limestone about once a year. Um, our bases, that's the more alkaline stuff. We don't neutralize that. We, we bottle it up and send it to a, to a 
a, a, a hazardous waste handler. We don't have a facility for doing that. But well, one thing we CDL is coming with a product too, which is going to be a storage tank that's going to have uh, automated dosing equipment on for some of these waters, um, whether they be from the RO or whether they be from the evaporator. Um, it is going to have some automated equipment on kind of a mixed tank. The material will go into a mixed tank. Um, the pH will automatically be read and it'll dose it with the proper amount of material to bring it back to neutral. And, and like I say, we're seeing that primary in Canada here this next year. So 